In June of 1942, two great armies were locked in deadly conflict in the deserts of North Africa. Both the British and their opponents knew that a German victory here could spell disaster for the Allied cause. And New Zealand might have lost in just one battle its entire fighting force of 17,000 men. We were surrounded in open desert by the much wanted German Africa Corps and in danger of being overrun and wiped out. And to make matters worse, the dynamic New Zealand commander, General Freiburg, lay seriously wounded. Our very survival depended on one defiant act. General Freiburg hated Germans. Once they had decided to endeavour to destroy the British Empire, as he pointed out they, were do they had done in, this, in the Second World War, as in the First, there was only one place for them, and that was that they should be killed. Freiburg had plenty to be anxious about at this stage. There'd been the defeat in Greece, closely followed by the loss of Crete. Two major disasters during his command of the New Zealanders. Freiburg himself wasn't to blame. But in New Zealand, people were worried about the heavy losses that had occurred. His own reputation was on the line with the government in spite of the reassurances they'd been given by the British. In North Africa, Freiburg and his men were about to confront an enemy commander who had many of Freiburg's own characteristics. General Erwin Rommel liked to move with his forward troops and share their dangers. He believed in seeing for himself and commanding from the front. I think it, as far as the general was concerned, he didn't uh, make uh, a hero out of Rommel, of course. He didn't, I think, see any reason to do so. Uh, but uh, he certainly treated him as being a, a general of uh, high uh, capacity, of great capacity, I should think, couldn't have done luck otherwise after having fought him for some years. Like Freiburg, Rommel believed in using maximum mobility. And he was an expert in working tanks, artillery and infantry in one closely united team. Today, no army would dream of sending in their infantry to fight alone while the tanks swanned off to do their own thing somewhere else. But back in 1941, that's exactly how the desert battles were being fought by the Allies. General Rommel knew the score and he always insisted on sending in his guns, his armour and his infantry together. At that time, General Freiburg had no battle tanks under his command. We had to rely on British armour. And unfortunately for the New Zealanders, it took a very long time for the British to get that message. We were fighting, clawing it with bare hands against the German tanks virtually in those days. And uh, we only survived through the incomparable uh, bravery and uh, energy of our own uh, infantry and artillery. Uh, it was a, a grim time indeed. The girl was pretty stony and a uh, little scrub, little low scrub on it. And uh, whenever, whenever a man was killed, you see, you took his rifle and his bayonet, uh, if you could get it, and stood beside him because it was dead flat and you couldn't uh, see the bodies, you see. And then the, the graves unit would come along and register it and so on. The interesting thing is that years later, when they came to exhume these graves, they're in very good order because the sand is so dry, or what sand they could get was so dry. The stakes were enormous. The Suez Canal was vital to the Commonwealth because it was a focal point on the sea and oil routes of the world. And it was to protect this channel that many of the bitter battles of those years were fought. Now that the other end of the Mediterranean had been blocked by enemy action, this canal became even more important. The Suez Canal gave access to the British naval base at Alexandria on the Egyptian coast. The entire area was one vast British base, and it contained the very lifeblood of Allied operations, oil. The war was fueled entirely by this precious commodity. Without oil, Allied operations would have collapsed. 
I recall those years in the desert as a time of challenge and achievement, of shared dangers, triumphs, and tragic losses. We'd learned some bitter lessons in Greece and Crete, but we'd put those failed campaigns behind us as we prepared for the next. General Freiburg was in his element in the harsh conditions of North Africa, and in my view, it was here that he achieved the pinnacle of his long fighting career. He was just the man to command mobile troops in hard-hitting encounters. But first, Freiburg had to rebuild the division after Greece and Crete. Nearly a third of the original force that had sailed from Wellington just a year beforehand had to be replaced. Freiburg threw all his energy into bringing his men up to desert fighting trim again. In his view, it was here that we reached the highest level of performance ever. Freiburg reported back home, the New Zealanders are ready to return to the attack. We needed to be. The German presence had introduced an entirely new element into the desert battles. By the middle of 1941, Rommel had driven the British forces right back to the Egyptian frontier, leaving the port town of Tobruk an isolated garrison. Rommel planned to push on to the Nile, but the British struck back in an effort to relieve Tobruk and destroy the German forces. The battle revealed the same old faults, infantry and tanks fighting separately. Freiburg was concerned about the British commander's plan, and he said so. He was rebuffed and told he was getting jumpy. But he was soon proved right. In the battle that followed, the Germans smashed the British armor, then mauled the New Zealand infantry. In just four days, the Allies lost more than 500 tanks to the Germans 100. Freiburg's force was split up by orders from above and left exposed without adequate tank support. It was a ghastly battle. One of the worst, I think, that I've been in. The Germans completely dominated it with their machine guns and they mowed our men down. I thought our men were magnificent. Radio vans would broadcast, BBC broadcast to us. And uh, one of those said we had the enemy surrounded in Libya. And after this firing in all directions from our little hollow one day, one of our gunners said, yeah, we've got him surrounded, all right. We've got him surrounded from the inside. On a personal level, Freiburg's legendary luck held. At one stage, he was within an ace of becoming a statistic or one of the Germans' most prized prisoners. Visibility was pretty bad. There were trucks alike, a lot of smoke, a lot of dust. And uh, when it cleared a little, three great German tanks were sitting amongst the battery of the six field. And New Zealand soldiers were surrendering to the Germans. Stephen going. And uh, General Freiburg said, uh, what do we do now? And I said, go back to 4th headquarters, uh, to 4th Brigade headquarters. We'd uh, come past it during the night. It was only about a mile back. So I went over to my car to uh, get into it, and uh, it wouldn't go. I can remember now the driver pressing the button and so we bailed out. We started to run, at least we were too proud to run, but we started to jog. And while we were jogging, the tank saw us and one of them shot and killed the driver. Both armies had fought themselves to a standstill, each bloodied, battered, but unable to deliver the vital knockout blow. More New Zealanders were killed in this short campaign than in any other battle of the entire war. Almost 900 lost their lives. Eloquent testimony of what had happened to the New Zealanders is here in the Alamein Cemetery only a few metres from the road that they followed back towards their base camp. 
Over just nine months of 1941, almost half of Freiburg's original strength had either been killed or taken prisoner. In fact, the division was now so battered that it was out of battle for several months. The Kiwis were pulled out of the line and sent to Syria to lick their wounds. It took a full three months before they were back in fighting trim. Meanwhile, Freiburg received a vote of confidence from the highest level. He was knighted by the king. From now on, he was Major General Sir Bernard Freiburg. Back in the desert, the Allies were in deep trouble. Rommel had struck hard with his customary force and skill, overrunning Tobruk and driving the British 8th Army back in battle after battle. For a while, it seemed his relentless progress could never be halted. When Freiburg heard the news, he realised that this was a moment of crisis. Without waiting to consult the New Zealand government, the general ordered the revitalised division back into the eye of the storm. As they raced to fill the gap in the Allied line, they met the battered 8th Army in full retreat. Coming down in the opposite direction from us, coming down from the front, was this great mass of transport and men. And they could only be described as men. There were Air Force, Army mixed up. Few of them seemed to be carrying arms, and many of them appeared to be quite panic-stricken. The most common uh, comment we got from them uh, in very loud voices uh, was, you're going the wrong way, Kiwi. When we came down on this thousand mile dash from Baalbek, we were ordered into uh, Mersmetru Fortress. Mersmetru is a, a port very similar to Tobruk, but further along the coast. And it had been defended in the days of Graziani's campaign in 1940. But uh, subsequent to that, the defences had been left to fall to pieces. But apart from that, uh, General Freiburg had a, a rooted objection to a fortress mentality, the Maginot mentality, he used to call it. And he refused to put the division into the Mersmetru fortress, which would have been met, meant we were fighting with our backs to the sea. And so he ordered the division, as soon as we were within hours of our arrival, out into the western desert, about 20 miles south at Mink Requiem, which was a, uh, a slight rise, nothing very much. All the desert was pretty flat round there. And he decided he'd fight it out against the Africa Corps in the open. And had he not made this very bold and wise decision, the whole lot of us would have been put in the bag. There's no question about that whatever, because the German Africa Corps was still pretty effective, although they'd come a long way. But they could easily have surrounded us and captured us as easily as they captured the South Africans a few weeks, a few days before in Tobruk. So that uh, we have a vast amount, those of us that survived, to thank the general for not succumbing to senior orders and bottling us up in Mersmetru. The New Zealanders role would be to hold Rommel's thrust into Egypt long enough for the rest of the 8th Army to regroup on a new defence line. The Africa Corps showed up next morning. As the day dawned, we saw signs of movement on the northern horizon. And as the day wore on, we could see this vast column of German vehicles moving across our northern flank. Uh, hundreds and hundreds of vehicles, just as specks on the horizon, crossing in front of us. And uh, we sent one or two uh, detachments out to harass them, but unfortunately they sometimes got harassed in return. Uh, the Germans had a certain amount of uh, air activity on their side at the time, but I, I remember most, uh, not so much the fighting during the day, as this sense of the enormous scale of the German advance. By late afternoon, we were surrounded and under constant attack. There was no chance of outside help. The rest of the 8th Army was heading back to regroup. Rommel had liquidated isolated groups before, and it now seemed quite likely that the entire New Zealand fighting force would be swallowed up by the Axis flood. Freiburg wasn't about to allow his cherished division to become one massive casualty 
at the hands of an enemy that he'd hated and despised for years. He had total faith in his men. He knew that there'd be more hard fighting ahead and he wanted his New Zealanders to play their part. Freiburg ordered them to break out of the German stranglehold that night. As he prepared that action, Freiburg's forceful leadership almost came to a tragic end. The general decided that he must have a look for himself. So here we were out in front of all our forward lines of defence when down came the salvo and we, uh, he got badly wounded with shrapnel through the back of his neck. It had great effect on, uh, on our men having seen him early in the morning and then late that afternoon to hear that he had been wounded. We didn't know how badly wounded he was but uh, the morale just went down that the general was out of action. The great soldier and fatherly figure that we uh, adored suddenly was uh, no more uh, in battle. That affected the morale of uh, at least um, my platoon and that would be a reflection of the whole battalion. Just before 2 a.m. with bayonets fixed, the Kiwis set off straight at the German lines. The breakout was led by Brigadier Jim Burrows, the man who'd commanded the abortive Kiwi counter-attack on Kiwi. This time, though, Burrows wasn't going to be stopped. Well, I was absolutely certain, without any shadow of doubt, that we couldn't fail, just by the, the attitude of the men silent and determined, not a sound. When the firing broke out, there'd be a little bit of recoil everywhere, all around, uh, and then surging forward again. Among them was one of the very, very few men ever to be awarded the second Victoria Cross for outstanding bravery in battle, Captain Charles Upham. I remember saying to our fellows there, uh, I said, we've got to make a job of this because I said, oh, Tony will be coming through behind us in an ambulance. And that would have, you know, made the fellows even more determined. That was the esteem he was held in. And he did come through in an ambulance. Uh, but uh, that was, uh, you know, the fellows wouldn't have let Tony fall into the hands of the Huns. It was my real baptism in fire. I still say even to this day, I don't know how anyone can come out of it alive when just a mess and a hail of uh, fire coming at you from all directions, from the flank, from the front, anti-tank guns were being used at you, you know, and for the first time with a bullet uh, whizzing past your uh, ear, you can always tell the very close ones. And, and you know, phew, you knew it was very close. But there's no use turning your head one way or the other or doing you had a job to do and uh, well you just went and uh, fortunately we got through and one of my ncos described it afterwards to me as uh, he said we were like a pack of all black fords he said nothing was going to stop us and this was right nothing did stop them you could hear in the soft sand you could hear trucks churning through the sand with germans jumping aboard and trying to get away because they will not no troops in the world will stand up to our folk in a night attack. I, I assure you of that. No troops in the world. Former all-black captain Jack Griffiths, a nimble first five, was well used to dropping hefty men in his rugby playing days. But that night, the roar of the guns replaced that of the crowds as he made perhaps his most vital flying tackle ever. The infantry attack was successful. The transport was going through when suddenly uh, we hit the... German tank line, the 90th light as well, and all hell broke loose, as you can imagine. There was tracer bullets flying all over the place, through this, through that, and there was, everything was screaming and going on, and although heavily dosed with morphia, the general got to his feet. He still had his web belt on and his pistol. He grabbed his pistol, had it up above his head, raving round the caravan, saying, this is balaclava, this is balaclava. I was in an awkward position, not being uh, strong enough to manhandle him, so I had to tackle him, to put him back on his bed and hold him there.
Once again, the New Zealanders had confronted Rommel and got away with it, this time fairly cheaply. Miraculously, fewer than 140 men were left behind in that midnight scramble, and we'd given the Africa Corps quite a shock and slowed down their rate of advance. The next morning, General Freiburg was transferred to a New Zealand hospital, and he refused to be operated on until he'd given headquarters his account of the battle. After that, he was out of action for several weeks, fretting through the vicious battles that were to follow. I'd heard so many stories of the courage and leadership of General Freiburg that I had not expected to find such an easy patient to nurse. He was so cooperative, so kindly, thoughtful and generous. I made a visit to the general every day in hospital from the, our base and it wasn't long before he wanted to know what was in the SITREP, the situation reports, at the headquarters of the force in Cairo. So each morning during the operations I went to look at the map and mark the map so that I could show him or tell him what the position was. Well, he was wounded at the base of the neck, fortunately missing the vertebral column and the spinal cord. The exit area was behind the ear, fortunately missing the jugular vein. The area was large enough for a man's pocket handkerchief to have been pulled through, so there was great need to watch for complications that might arise in this dangerous area. The Eighth Army was on the defensive, fending off Rommel's thrusts. Tactics hadn't improved much, and twice more the panzers overran our infantry when our tanks failed to turn up. The British commander told his officers Rommel is becoming a kind of magician or bogeyman to our troops who are talking far too much about him. Forget the idea that Rommel represents something more than an ordinary German general. The fact is, Rommel was special. But fortunately, the same was true of a new star that now appeared in the Egyptian sky. Bernard Montgomery, fresh from England, took over command in North Africa. At last, Freiburg had a commander who thought like him. From what Monty told me in later years, he had great respect for Bernard Freiburg as a man and as a, as a fighter and who somebody who knew how to conduct a battle. I mean, Monty normally thought that nobody but himself knew how to conduct a battle, and Freiburg thought much the same. But they did have rather similar ideas about it, and so each, I think, respected the other. We'd had experience of quite a number of higher commanders by this time, but we soon realized that this man, Montgomery, was different. He was unconventional, but he was deadly serious about winning some battles. And General Freiburg, for one, responded to that. When Monty arrived, the Eighth Army was tired, confused, still battling on, but conscious that there could be further retreats. Montgomery quickly put an end to that. He said, we stand and fight where we are. He himself was constantly on the move, letting himself be seen by as many of his men as possible. Monty's arrival quickly brought a change in fortune. Just as Freiburg had always wanted, Monty ordered his tanks to dig in and support the infantry when Rommel unleashed his final drive to Cairo. This time, the old mistakes weren't going to be repeated. Rommel was stopped in his tracks by the Eighth Army, now strongly supported by the Desert Air Force, with the New Zealanders right in the thicket. We saw that Rommel wasn't invincible after all. The tide had started to turn. At last, after 10 punishing weeks, the New Zealanders came out of the line and there was time for a spot of leave and recreation. Fortunately, there were plenty of facilities available, apart from the dubious delights of Cairo and Alexandria. General Freiburg had always shown tremendous concern for the welfare of his men, and it was really at his insistence that the first New Zealand Forces Club, the first of many throughout the theatre, was established in Cairo. The clubs were staffed by New Zealand women, with Freiburg's wife Barbara as their leader. His attitude was that if you were organising a club, the, uh, it was a mistake to leave it in the hands of men, because any, anything they dealt with 
like that, as he put it, it would look like a barrack room. Our original name with which we left New Zealand was Women's War Service Auxiliary Overseas Welfare Division. Yes, a bit formidable. And I think uh, Mrs. Freiberg, as she was then, uh, decided that this was a bit difficult. Uh, and she thought, right, if my general's troops are Kiwis, mine are Tui's, and it was as simple as that, it stuck. Well, we had to do a lot of work, and we worked very, very hard and long hours and very hot temperatures. But when one stage the division was in Cairo on leave, uh, they were out at um, Māori, and that was quite the busiest time I've ever experienced in my life. And there was just food, food, food everywhere for, you know, all these thousands of men. We used to have to make sandwiches uh, every day, 400 loaves of bread a day and sandwiches. We had cases and cases of oranges that we physically squeezed by hand. A lot of us ended up with tennis elbow, I might add, you know, doing this. We had to make, oh, they serve the cakes, and it was just sort of chaos. In the bars, where the girls didn't serve, there was often New Zealand beer, but wherever it came from, it was cheap, so cheap that it began to cause problems. Out in the desert, Everyone had received one can or one bottle of beer per week, if he was lucky. So now the troops were intent on making up for lost time while the going was good. So the, gen the general had no sooner got inside than he was slapped on the back by troops. Good on you, tiny. And uh, beer spilt all over the place. And somebody handed him a handle of beer, which he... Uh, which he... Uh, <laughs> sipped at from time to time. Um, but he went right round the whole bar and getting slapped on the back and beer spilt everywhere. And, and uh, he was very noble about it and the trips were very fond of him, really. Otherwise, he probably wouldn't have got the reception he did. And when he came out, he said, my God, can't these Kiwis drink? <laughs> Freiburg pressed for the creation of a concert party to entertain the troops. And the boisterous Kiwis, hoping perhaps that the worst days were behind them, made up for lost time. Freiburg never lost his interest in rugby and swimming and encouraged every kind of sporting activity possible. And of course, when Kiwis and South Africans were together anywhere, the result was a game of rugby. We were out of the line, the South Africans were about to go in, but our general decided that the great thing we must have would be a South African New Zealand rugby match. Our team and under the Reverend Frank Green was put into camp for one week to train. It was led by a well-known uh, rugby administrator and rugby player, J.L. Sullivan, Jack Sullivan. And we had quite a strong team. The exercise was that uh, the whole division was spread out into the desert from uh, uh, Bargoose and that they would march in on a route march to witness the game and uh, then march back again. You could imagine that th thousands and thousands of troops doing this sort of thing, something had to be done from a security point of view. 
So the RAF were brought into a party and they gave air cover whilst the Navy at sea were on, on alert. So uh, uh, the whole afternoon went off without uh, incident from enemy action, but uh, good action from the New Zealand team because it uh, just managed to win. But soon the New Zealanders were to face a tougher game, a return match against Rommel and the Africa Corps. Their encounter was to be part of one of the great battles of history and at a place few of us had ever heard of, El Alamein. In 1942, Alamein was just a railway siding and this one building. A few kilometres ahead, the opposing forces faced each other in a great arc, running from the coast to the north, round to the south and finishing 50 kilometres inland on the edge of a great sea of sand that was impassable to vehicle. For this battle, we'd have twice as many men as the enemy and a thousand tanks to their 600. But we'd had that kind of advantage before and still come off second best. This time, Monty was going to get it right. Montgomery would secretly concentrate four infantry divisions in the north and use them to punch a hole through the enemy defences. British forces would operate in the south. When the German line had been broken, our tanks were to charge into the open desert and draw the enemy tanks into a decisive battle. General Freiburg didn't like the look of it. He thought it would just be a repetition of the old story of the British armour away fighting their own battle somewhere while the rest of us were left to face the attentions of the Africa Corps. He and the other Commonwealth commanders dug their toes in and persuaded Monty at that late stage to change that part of his plan. It was just as well they did. Now when the hole had been cut, the British tanks would come forward only as far as our front line and wait there to support our forward troops when Rommel's armour counterattacked. Now we had tanks we could rely on. They were on loan from the British, but under Freiburg's personal command, while our own tank brigade was being formed back at Cairo. The plan was for an infantry attack at night, covered by a 900-gun artillery barrage. The first time such a technique had been used since World War I. On October the 23rd, after weeks of preparation, we waited for the start of the great battle. When the barrage opened on October the 23rd, 1942, no one was there will ever forget it as long as he lived because the noise was absolutely um, fantastic. We'd heard nothing like it in the Second World War before. Also, of course, the boundaries for the infantry companies and battalions were marked out with Bofors firing tracers. We had searchlights reflected off the clouds to try to lighten it all up. And it really was the most um, frightening, horrifying example of man's destruction. We turned round and could see this enormous barrage behind us. The flash of the guns was so intriguing. In fact, I think for the first hundred yards or so, most of us were more or less walking backwards looking at it. Terrific. And right to my dying days, I shall always remember going into battle in the dust and the explosions and showings that was landing all over the place of shells was the bagpipes going into battle. I think that really stirred my people up, my troops and myself. Here were my troops, uh, their own battle cries have come out there, come out there, and here were the Black Watch uh, with the pipes going into action. To me, that will always remain in my memory, uh, and it really stirred me to hear the pipes with the Black Watch going into battle. It was a stupendous sight. 
and for Freiburg, a moment of reflection. The general made the comment, if ever there was a just cause, this is it. And then he had already prepared for this moment. I think through his ADC, he had, had, um, had been carrying around a bottle of French Burgundy. And he and the uh, chief of staff toasted our cause on that occasion. We were being shot at by a German machine gun emplacement. We charged it. Several of the boys in my platoon got hit on the way. As we reached the emplacement, the Germans got up to surrender. But we thought, no, too late, chum. Uh, and so I'm afraid they got their measure. This imperceptible rise running up from the Alamein station was the New Zealanders' objective. When daylight came, it was clear that a big dent had been made in the enemy line, but there was no breakthrough. Our tanks were unable to break through the enemy crust here, and the Germans seemed unable to mass enough force to push us back. Up to the north, the Australians made a gallant attempt to get a breakthrough there and failed. It seemed as if the battle might turn into a stalemate. As usual, General Freiburg was well forward and he knew exactly what was going on. And eventually it fell to him to break the stalemate. Montgomery agreed to change the direction of the attack. A new thrust was now mounted under Freiburg's command using his tanks, the 9th British Armoured Brigade. This time it worked, thanks largely to those tank units which fought with tremendous gallantry and suffered terrible casualties. The Axis forces at last began to crumble. In one critical day, the 8th Army broke through and rounded up 30,000 prisoners. As the pursuit of the defeated enemy began, the British tank divisions and our own pushed through the one small gap in the enemy line. It was here that I had my first personal experience of the general. I'd just been appointed to the headquarters when the chief of staff fell sick and overnight I was pitched into that job. I was just 26 and a bit out of my league. Anyway, my immediate job was to move 2,500 vehicles and about 17,000 men in pitch darkness out through a narrow gap in the enemy lines and form them up on the other side. After a couple of hours, I had to go to General Freiburg and say that I'd lost his division. I didn't know where any of them were. He looked at me and said, old boy, you should never worry about things that you can't help. And of course, we got ourselves sorted out in the morning. But I never forgot his kindness to a new hand, and I never forgot that advice. The battle was a turning point for the Allies. For the first time in the war, a British force had routed a German one, and the New Zealanders had played a key role. Montgomery said the New Zealanders had fought magnificently and he was lavish in his praise of Freiburg. He wrote, Such outstanding leadership can rarely have been seen in the history of the British Army. Now began an exciting period for us as we chased Rommel's dwindling forces across the face of Africa for hundreds of kilometres. It was a task which suited both Freiburg and his division. Freiburg was in his element, always close to the front, occasionally in the lead. General Freiburg's enthusiasm for keeping well forward occasionally got us into trouble. One day our tank actually became the leading vehicle of the entire division as we moved across the desert. I thought very inappropriately. Sure enough, we ran slap into a German rear guard that opened fire on us with high-velocity guns. As usual, the general was sitting on the outside of my tank, and he too moved with extraordinary velocity in through the turret of the tank as we zigzagged across the desert, taking avoiding action. He was a very brave man, but not a foolhardy one. Well, um, I think everybody in the desert who ever came across General Freiburg had the most immense admiration for his courage. Uh, which was uh, absolutely evident from the way he always was up where things were at their hottest. I mean, I have a vivid memory uh, of seeing him in, that, in the most tense period of those November-December battles in 41, standing there with a radio microphone in his hand, uh, talking calmly in, into the radio with, while 
stuff was going about all over the place. I mean, he, he was, I mean, sometimes you thought he, he went a bit too far that way. Um, it was no joke being told to go and see General Freiburg in the middle of a battle. He was a big man in every way. I mean, he not only was a big man physically, but he was a big man from the point of view of his character. Uh, and um, the example he set was a, a splendid one which everybody admired. Time after time, the Desert Fox came within an ace of being trapped by the Eighth Army, but he always managed to slip away. Desperately short of fuel, Rommel had to avoid full-scale battle at all costs. For Rommel and his panzers, the game was almost up. A few days after we reached the pleasant greenness of Tripoli, we had advice that a mysterious Mr. Bullfinch was going to visit us. It wasn't too much of a surprise when it turned out to be Winston Churchill. We put on a full divisional parade in his honor. Nobody likes parades too much, but we felt that this was a real red letter day. And Churchill left us in no doubt what he thought about it. Our attitude to the people of New Zealand who have sent this splendid division to win glory across the ocean on behalf of the people, all the people of the homeland, I give you our expression of earnest, warm-hearted thanks. Churchill appeared in a jeep, and he got her out of the jeep and almost in front of me and embraced General Freiburg, and uh, tears were running down his cheeks. It was a great moment for Winston. And then he came forward and shook hands with the general and said, Bernard, thank God you're here. He referred to Freiburg as the salamander of the British Empire. In those days, we still had an empire. And uh, there was a rush for dictionaries, of course. <laughs> Everybody wanted to know what a salamander was. He asked me first, uh, because I was the closest one, and uh, I said, I don't, I, I'm not sure, but it's some sort of a lizard. He said, no, it's not. He said, it's the name of a brand of cooking pots. He'd call me a blooming cooking pot. We soon learned that a salamander is a legendary creature that lives in fire. That symbolism wasn't lost on Freiburg, and he later used the Churchill imagery in his coat of arms when he became Lord Freiburg. Admirable symbolism for a man like Freiburg. And there was still going to be plenty of fire for him to go through as he led us westward through battle after battle and over hundreds of kilometers of desert, till at last the Axis forces were utterly defeated and pushed out of Africa for good, apart from 230,000 left behind as prisoners of war. The tide of victory had truly begun to turn. New Zealand had played a major part in the victory. Freiburg returned home with a first-hand account of the battles and good news for anxious families. I can tell you this. Uh, the, d the division are at present back uh, from Tunisia, uh, enjoying a well-earned rest in Cairo. They are in uh, excellent heart. I saw every unit before I came away, and they have sent to their people here in New Zealand uh, every good wish. Freiburg had also arranged for soldiers who'd been away the longest to come home on three months' leave. It was a simple and welcome scheme, but back home the returning soldiers saw lots of young men like themselves who plainly had no intention of going to the war. So many of the veterans refused to go back. Obviously it was a mistake to bring the troops back without any plan, except that they return to the war again. By this time, we were a bit disappointed with the, the attitudes of a lot of uh, people in the country uh, with this so-called essential industry. And uh, we felt that 
we could replace anybody. Uh, we'd done jobs we'd never ever th thought of doing over the last few years, so we reckoned that we were uh, able to do the same again in New Zealand industry. The attitude of the men who had, who had come home after long service, particularly under the influence of um, arguments here in New Zealand, that there were a lot of able-bodied men who hadn't been away at all, uh, for good, no, sometimes for good reason, sometimes for bad, perhaps, and that it was not, um, it was understandable that they didn't want to come back, particularly under, the, under the, remembering that uh, their womankind were also involved in this. And I think that was the general's view. Public sympathy was with the men. Even Parliament understood their grievances, and in future, men who came home on leave stayed here. In the end, only 1,500 of the 6,000 who'd made the stand went back to rejoin the division. Freiburg didn't have time to worry about the furlough fiasco. He was thinking about what lay ahead. The New Zealand division left the deserts behind and set off to fight in Italy. I suppose for most Kiwis, Italy conjured up visions of ancient monuments, medieval castles bathed in sunshine. Well, we were in for a shock. In practice, Italy proved to be just a series of natural defences, and ahead of us lay months of bitter fighting in filthy weather, a campaign that would link Freiburg's name with one of the most controversial events of the entire war. Next on Television One, we update the events of the day with the...